This is a reading from the book titled Microbe Hunters by Paul de Croo, published in 1926. Chapter 4, Koch, the Death Fighter. Remember that this was published in 1926, and as such, some of the ideas and language may be a little different than what we might find normal today. Part 1. In those astounding and exciting years between 1860 and 1870, when Pasteur was saving vinegar industries and astonishing emperors, and finding out what ailed six silkworms, a small, serious, and nearsighted German was learning to be a doctor at the University of Göttingen. His name was Robert Koch. He was a good student, but while he hacked at cadavers, he dreamed of going tiger hunting in the jungle. Conscientiously, he memorized the names of several hundred bones and muscles. But the fancied moan of whistles of steamers bound for the east chased this Greek and Latin jargon out of his head. Koch wanted to be an explorer, or to be a military surgeon and win iron crosses, or to be a ship's doctor and voyage to impossible places. But alas, when he graduated from the medical college in 1866, he became an intern in a not very interesting insane asylum in Hamburg. Here, busy with raving maniacs and helpless idiots, the echoes of Pasteur's prophecies that, were, that there were such things as terrible man-killing microbes hardly reached Koch's ears. He was still listening for steamer whistles. In the evenings, he took walks down by the wharves with Emily Fretz. He begged her to marry him. He held out the bait of romantic trips around the world to her. Emmy told Robert that she would marry him, but on the condition that he forget this nonsense about an adventurous life, provided that he would settle down to be a practicing doctor, a useful and good citizen in Germany. Koch listened to Emmy. For a moment, the allure of fifty years of bliss with her chased away his dreams of elephants in Patagonia and he settled down to practice medicine. He began what was to him a totally uninteresting practice of medicine in a succession of unromantic Prussian villages. Just now, while Koch wrote prescriptions and rode horseback through the mud and waited up nights for Prussian farmer women to have their babies, Lister in Scotland was beginning to save lives of women in childbirth by keeping microbes away from them. Professors and the students of the medical colleges of Europe were beginning to be excited and to quarrel about Pasteur's theory of malignant microbes. Here and there, men were trying crude experiments, but Koch was almost as completely cut off from this world of science as old Leeuwenhoek had been 200 years before, when he first fumbled at grinding glass into lenses in Delft in Holland. It looked as if his fate was to be consoling the sick people and the beneficent and praiseworthy attempt to save lives of dying people. Mostly, of course, he did not save them, and his wife, Emmy, was quite satisfied with this and was proud when Koch earned $5.45 on an especially busy day. But Robert Koch was restless. He trekked from one deadly village to another, still more uninteresting until at last he came to Wolstein in East Prussia, and here, on his 28th birthday, Mrs. Koch bought him a microscope to play with. You can hear the good woman say, maybe that will take Robert's mind off what he calls this stupid practice. Perhaps this will satisfy him a little. He's always looking at everything with his old magnifying glass. Alas for her, this new microscope, this plaything took her husband on more curious adventures than any he would have met in Tahiti or Lahore in these weird experiences that Pasteur had dreamed of, but which no man had ever before came on him out of the dead carcasses of sheep and cows. These new sights and adventures jumped at him, and possibly on his very doorstep in his own drug-reeking office that he was so tired of, that he was beginning to loathe. I hate this bluff that my medical practice is. It isn't because I 
do not want to save babies from diphtheria, but mothers come to me crying, asking me to save their babies, and what can I do? Hope? Fumble? Reassure them that I know there is no hope? How can I cure diphtheria when I do not even know what causes it, when the wisest doctor in Germany doesn't know? So you can imagine Koch complaining bitterly to Emmy, who was irritated and puzzled, and thought that it was a young doctor's business to do as well as he could with the great deal of knowledge that he had got at medical school. Oh, would he ever be, would he never be satisfied? But Koch was right. What indeed did doctors know about the mysterious causes of disease? Pasteur's experiments were brilliant, but they had proved nothing about the how and why of human sickness. Pasteur was a trailblazer, a forerunner, crying possible future vic great victories over disease, shouting about magnificent stampings out of epidemics. But we, meanwhile, the mujiks of desolate towns in Russia were still warding off scourges by hitching four widows to a plow and with them drawing a furrow round their village in the dead of night, and their doctors had no sounder protection to offer them. But the professors, the great doctors in Berlin, Robert, they must know what is the cause of these sicknesses. You don't know how to stop. So Frau Crouch, Crouch might have tried to console him. But in 1873, that is only 50 years ago, I must repeat that the most eminent doctors had not one bit better explanation for the causes of epidemics than the ignorant Russian villagers who hitched the town widows to their plows. In Paris, Pasteur was preaching that microbes would soon be found to be the murderers of consumptives, and against this crazy prophet rose the whole corps of doctors of Paris, headed by the distinguished brass button Dr. Pideau. What? roared this Pideau. Consumption due to a germ, one definite kind of germ? Nonsense! A fatal thought. Consumption is one and many at the same time. Its conclusion is the necrobiotic and affecting destruction of the plasmatic tissue of an organ by a number of roads that the hygienist and the physician must endeavor to close. It was so that doctors fought Pasteur's prophecies which, uh, with utterly meaningless and often idiotic words. Part 2 Koch was spending his evenings fussing with his new microscope. He was beginning to find out just the right amount of light to shoot up into his lenses with the reflecting mirror. He was learning just how needful it was to have his thin glass slide shining clean, those bits of glass on which he liked to put drops of blood from the carcasses of sheep and cows that had died of anthrax. Anthrax was a strange disease which was worrying farmers all over Europe, that here and there ruined some prosperous owner of a thousand sheep, that in another place sneaked in and killed the cow, the one support of a poor widow. There was no rhyme or reason to the way this plague conducted its maraudings. One day a fat lamb and a flock might be frisking about. That evening this same lamb refused to eat. His head drooped a little. And the next morning the farmer would find him cold and stiff, his blood turned ghastly black. And the same thing would happen to another lamb and a sheep, four sheep, six sheep, and there was no stopping it. And then the farmer himself, and a shepherd, and a wool sorter, and a dealer in hides might break out in horrible boils, or gasp their last breaths in a swift pneumonia. Koch had started using his microscope with the more or less thorough aimlessness, aimlessness of old Leeuwenhoek. He examined everything under the sun until he ran onto the blood of sheep and cattle dead of anthrax. Then he began to concentrate, to forget about making a call when he found a dead sheep in a field. He haunted butcher shops to find out about farms where anthrax was killing flocks. Koch hadn't the leisure of Leeuwenhoek. He had to snatch moments for his peerings, between prescribing for some child that bawled with a bellyache and the pulling out of a villager's aching tooth. In these 
interrupted hours, he put drops of the blackened blood of a cow dead of anthrax between two thin pieces of glass, very clean, shining bits of glass. He looked down the tube of his microscope, and among the wee, round, drifting, greenish globules of this blood he saw strange things that looked like little sticks. Sometimes these sticks were short. There might be only a few of them, floating, quivering a little, among the blood globules. But here were others, hooked together without joints, many of them, ingeniously glued together till they appeared to him like long threads, a thousand times thinner than the finest silk. What are these things? Are they microbes? Are they alive? They do not move. Maybe the sick blood of these poor beasts just changes into these little threads and rods, Koch pondered. Other men of science, Duvain and Rayer in France, had seen the same things in the blood of dead sheep, and they had announced that these rods were bacilli, living germs, that they were undoubtedly the real cause of anthrax. But they hadn't proved it, and except for Pasteur, no one in Europe believed them. But Koch was not particularly interested in what anybody else thought about the threads and rods and the bloods, blood of dead sheep and cattle. The doubts and the laughter of doctors failed to disturb him, and the enthusiasms of Pasteur did not for one moment make him jump at conclusions. Luckily, nobody anxious to develop young microbe hunters had ever heard of Koch. He was a lone wolf searcher. He was his own man, alone with the mysterious tangled threads in the blood of the dead beasts. I do not see a way yet of finding out whether these little sticks and threads are alive, he meditated. But there are other things to learn about them. Then, curiously, he stopped studying diseased creatures and began fussing around with perfectly healthy ones. He went down to the slaughterhouses and visited the string butchers and hobnobbed with the meat merchants of Wolstein and got bits of blood from tens, dozens, fifties of healthy beasts that had been slaughtered for meat. He stole a little more time from his tooth pullings and professional laying, layings on of hands. More and more Mrs. Koch worried at his not tending to his practice. He bent over his microscope, hours on end, watching the drops of healthy blood. Those threads and rods are never found in the blood of any healthy animal, Koch pondered. This is all very well, but it doesn't tell me whether they are bacilli, whether they are alive. It doesn't show me that they grow, breed, or multiply. But how to find this out? Consumptives, whom alas he could not help, babies choking with diphtheria, old ladies who imagined they were sick, all of his cares of a good physician began to be shoved away into one corner of his head. How to prove these wee sticks are alive? This question made him forget to sign his name on prescriptions. It made him a morose husband. It made him call the carpenter in to put in a partition in his doctor's office. And behind this wall, Koch stayed more and more hours with a microscope and drops of black blood, of sheep mysteriously dead, and with a growing number of cages full of scampering white mice. I haven't the money to buy sheep and cows for my experiments, you can hear him muttering, while some impatient invalid shuffled her feet in the waiting room. Besides, cows would be a little inconvenient to have around my office, but maybe I can give anthrax to these mice. Maybe in them, I can prove that the sticks really grow. So this foiled globetrotter started on his strange explorations. To me, Koch is still more weird and uncanny microbe hunter, hunter than Leeuwenhoek. Certainly, he was just as much of a self-made scientist. Koch was poor, and he had his nose on the grindstone, grindstone of a medical practice. All the science he knew was what a common medical course had taught him. And from this, God knows, he had learned nothing, whatever, 
about the art of doing experiments. He had no apparatus but Emmy's birthday present, that beloved microscope. Everything else he had to invent and fashion out of bits of wood and strings and sealing wax. Worst of all, when he came into the living room from his mice and microscope to tell Frau Koch about the new strange things he had discovered, this good lady wrinkled up her nose and told him, But Robert, you smell so. Then he hit upon a sure way to give mice the fatal disease of anthrax. He hadn't a convenient syringe with which to shoot the poisonous blood into them, but after sundry cursings and the ruin of a number of perfectly good mice, he took slivers of wood, cleaned them carefully, heated them in an oven to kill any chance of ordinary microbes that might be sticking to them. These slivers he dipped in drops of blood from a sheep dead of anthrax, blood filled with the mysterious, motionless threads and rods. And then, heaven knows how he managed to hold this wiggly mouse, he made a little cut with a clean knife at the root of the tail of that mouse. And into this cut, he delicately slid the blood-soaked splinter. He dropped this mouse into a separate cage and washed his hands and went off in a kind of conscientious wool-gathering way to see what was wrong with a sick baby. Will that beast, that mouse, die of anthrax? Your child will be able to go back to school next week, Frau Schmidt. I hope I didn't get any of that anthrax blood into that cut on my finger. Such was, was Koch's life. The next morning, Koch came into his homemade laboratory to find the mouse on its back, stiff, its formerly sleek fur standing on end, its whiteness of yesterday turned into a leaden blue, its legs sticking up in the air. He heated his knives, fastened the poor dead creature onto a board, dissected it, opened it down to its liver and lights, peered into every corner of its carcass. Yes, this looks like the inside of an anthrax sheep. See the spleen? How big, how black it is. It almost fills the creature's body. Swiftly, he cut with the clean, heated knife into its swollen spleen and put a drop of the blackish ooze from it before his lens. At last, he muttered, They're here, these sticks and threads. They are swarming in the body of this mouse exactly as they were in the drop of the dead sheep's blood that I dipped the little sliver in yesterday. Delighted, Koch knew that he had caused the mouse, what, that he had caused in the mouse, so cheap to buy, so easy to handle, the sickness of sheep and cows and men. Then, for a month, his life became a monotony of one dead mouse after another, as day after day he took a drop of the blood or the spleen of one dead beast, put it carefully on a clean splinter, and slid the sliver into a cut at the root of the tail of a new healthy mouse. Each time, next morning, Koch came into his lab laboratory to find the new animal had died of anthrax. And each time, in the blood of the dead beast, his lens showed him myriads of these sticks and tangled threads, those motionless twenty-five thousandth of an inch thick filaments that he could never discover in the blood of any healthy animal. These threads must be alive, Koch pondered. The sliver that I put into the mouse has a drop of blood on it, and that drop holds only a few hundreds of those sticks, and these have grown into billions in the short 24 hours in which the beast became sick and died. But, confound it, I must see these rods grow, and I can't look inside of a living mouse. How shall I find a way to see the rods grow out into threads? This question pounded at him while he, would, while he counted pulses and looked at his patient's tongues. In the evenings, he hurried through supper and growled goodnight to Mrs. Koch and shut himself up in his little room that smelled of mice and disinfectant and tried to find ways to grow his threads outside of a mouse's body. At this time, Koch knew little or nothing about the yeast soups and flasks of Pasteur, 
and the experiments he fussed with had the crude originality of the first caveman trying to make a fire. I will try to make these threads multiply in something that is as near as possible like the stuff of an animal's body is made of. It must be just like living stuff, Hutch muttered. And he put a wee pinpoint piece of spleen from a dead mouse, spleen that was packed with the tangled threads, into a little drop of the watery liquid from the eye of an ox. That ought to be good food for them, he grumbled. But maybe, too, the threads have got to have the temperature of a mouse's body to grow, he said and he built with his own hands a clumsy incubator heated by an oil lamp. In this uncertain machine he deposited the two flat pieces of glass between which he had put the drop of liquid from the ox eye. Then in the middle of the night, after he had gone to bed but not to sleep, he got up to turn the wick of the smoky incubator lamp down a little, and instead of going back to rest, Again and again he slid the thin strips of glass with their imprisoned, infinitely little sticks before his microscope. Sometimes he thought he could see them growing, but he could not be sure because other microbes, swimming and cavorting ones, had a, an abominable way, abominable way of getting in between these strips of glass, overgrowing, choking out the slender, dangerous rods of anthrax. I must grow my rods in pure absolutely pure, without any other microbes around, he muttered. And he kept floundering, trying ways to do this. And his perplexity pushed up huge wrinkles over the bridge of his nose and built crow's feet round his eyes. Then one day a perfectly easy, a foolishly simple way to watch his rods grow flashed into Koch's head. I'll put them in a hanging drop where no other bugs can get in among them, he muttered, on a flat, clear piece of glass, very thin, which he had heated thoroughly to destroy all chance of microbes. Koch placed a drop of the watery fluid of an eye from a just-butchered, healthy ox. Into this drop, he delicately inserted the weeest fragment of spleen, fresh out of a mouse that had a moment before died miserably of anthrax. Over the drop, he put a thick, oblong piece of glass with a concave well scooped out of it so that the drop would not be touched. Around this well, he had smeared some Vaseline to make the thin glass stick to the thick one. Then dexterously, he turned this simple apparatus upside down and presto. Here was his hanging drop his ox-eye fluid with its rod-swarming spleen imprisoned in the well, away from all other microbes. Koch did not know it, perhaps, but this, apart from that day when Leeuwenhoek first saw little animals in rainwater, was the most important moment in microbe hunting and in the fight of mankind against death. Nothing can get into that drop. Only the rods are there, and we'll see if they will grow, whispered Koch, as he slid his hanging drop under the lens of his microscope. In a kind of stolid excitement, he pulled his chair and sat down to watch what would happen next. In the gray circle of the field of his lens, he could see only a few shreddy lumps of mouse spleen. They looked microscopically enormous, and here and there, a very tiny rod floated among these shreds. He looked. Fifty minutes out of each hour, for two hours he looked, and nothing happened. But then a weird business began among the shreds of diseased spleen. An unearthly moving picture, a drama that made Shiver shoot up and down his back. The little drifting rods had begun to grow. There were two where there had been there were one had been before. There was one slowly stretching itself out into a tangled, endless thread, pushing its snaky way across the whole diameter of the field of the lens. In a couple of hours, the dead small chunks of spleen were completely hidden by the myriads of rods. The masses of threads that were 
like a hopelessly tangled ball of colorless yarn, living yarn, silent, murderous yarn. Now I know these rods are alive, breathed Koch. Now I see the way they grow into millions in my poor little mice, in the sheep, in the cows even. One of these rods, these bacilli, he is a billion times smaller than an ox. Just one of them maybe gets into an ox, and he doesn't bear any grudge against the ox. He doesn't hate him, but he grows. This bacillus in the millions, everywhere through the big animal, swarming in his lungs and brain, choking his blood vessels. It is terrible. Time, his office and his dull duties, his waiting and complaining patience, all of these things became nonsense, seemed of no account, were unreal to Koch, whose head was now full of nothing but dreadful pictures of the tangled skeins of anthrax threads. Then each day, a nervous experiment that lasted eight days, Koch repeated his miracle of making a million bacilli grow where only a few were before. He planted a wee bit of his rod swarming hanging drop onto a fresh pure drop of the watery fluid of an ox eye and in every one of these new drops the few rods grew into myriads i have grown these bacilli for eight generations away from any animal i have grown them pure apart from any other microbe there is no part of the dead mouse's spleen no disease tissue left in this eighth hanging drop. Only the children of the bacilli that killed the mouse are in it. Did these bacilli still grow in a mouse or in a sheep if I inject them? Are these threads really the cause of anthrax? Careful Koch smeared a wee bit of this hanging drop that swarmed with the microbes of the eighth generation. This drop was murky, even to his naked eye, with countless bacilli. He smeared a part of this drop onto a little splinter of wood. Then, with that guardian angel who cares for daring, stumbling, imprudent, imprudent researchers of nature, standing by him, Koch deftly slid the splinter under the skin of a healthy mouse. The next day, Koch was bending nearsightedly over the body of this little creature, pinned on his dissecting board, giddy with hope. He was careful, carefully flaming his knives. Not three minutes later, Koch is seated before his microscope, a bit of the dead creature's spleen between two thin bits of glass. I've proved it, he whispers. Here are the threads, the rods. Those little bacilli from my hanging drop were just as murderous as the ones right out of the spleen of a dead sheep. So it was that Koch found in his last mouse exactly the same kind of microbe that he had spied long before, having no idea it was alive. In the blood of the first dead cow he had peered at when his hands were fumbling and his microscope was new. It was precisely the same kind of bacillus that he had nursed so carefully through long success successions of mice, though I do not know how many hanging drops. First of all searchers, of all men that ever lived, ahead of the prophet Pasteur who blazed the trail for him, Koch had really made sure that one certain kind of microbe caused one definite kind of disease. That miserably small bacilli may be the assassins of formidable animals. He had angled for these impossibly tiny fish and spied on them without knowing anything at all of their habits, their lurking places, or how hardy they might be, or how vicious, of how easy it might be for them to leap upon him in the perfect ambush of their invisibility that their invisibility gave them. 